Well, nice to be back with everyone. And uh, you might remember last week, I mentioned that even if we're feeling quite strongly that cultivating mindful awareness in our life makes sense, and you know, on that basic intellectual level, nobody would ever say, you know what my plan is for life? Not being there, <laughs> you know, not being awake, not being sensitive, I mean, it, it's understandable that we choose distractedness and superficiality when things are overwhelming, but then it becomes a habit and it becomes harder and harder to be open, to be sensitive, to be right in the middle. So I mentioned last week that, you know, come Tuesday night, you may want to come, but just life interrupts and we're tired or this or that. It's hard to change habits. And there's more and more research now in the in uh, psychology departments around the country, you know, how difficult it is to change habit. It's like these tendencies that we've done, they get wired in. And, you know, when there's enough supporting conditions, we can manifest a different habit, but we really see how we tend to gravitate back. So I'm mentioning this now, and I'll talk more about it at week six, the last night, <clears throat> you know, just about how we create the supports. A lot of times in Buddhist centers, we talk about going against the stream, right? The culture the kind of habits of our friends and culture clearly revere distractedness, <laughs> right? So that's, that's, and you know, that's, we've internalized that. So it's not just out there, it's in here. Just our desire, our liking our distractions. Don't mess with my distractions. <laughs> you know, like if whatever it might be. And one of the things, you know, when we create a ritual of sitting every day, and remember, you get to choose the time, the amount of time. So choose an amount of time that you won't have that rubber band effect. Oh, I'm going to do two hours every day, you know? And then it's like, you walk away, I'm never going to meditate again. Because <laughs> there's this, when we're using that willful effort, you know, there's usually an equal and opposite effect. So the way it to change habits and to cultivate, especially this habit of being present, being aware, being more awake in life, is what, when we do do it, when we do set aside 10 minutes or 20 minutes, something that's actually workable in our lives, then in the beginning, in the middle, in the end, all the way through, we want to notice, even when it's hard, like we're sitting, but there's a lot of physical discomfort or we're sitting and we're just noticing a lot of difficult mind states. We want to be honest about that, but we also want to notice there's something that feels really right. Dare I say pleasant, even though all this other stuff I'm noticing, it's true, but I'm also noticing there's something really right about being present. And I really appreciate that. Because it's, you know, when we change habits, it's that we're finding something in the habit that's healing, that's fulfilling, that's pleasant, that keeps us coming back. Right? But we don't, you know, if it's, bitter medicine, we're not going to expect anything. But the Buddha was very clear that whatever it is we're doing, this cultivating moral sense, using awareness to cultivate moral sensitivity and the capacity for content, more contentment and generosity in our lives and just all the other positive reverberations of being present. The Buddha says this is pleasant in the beginning in the middle and in the end of the path. Not just you get all the desserts at the end, but you got to suffer all the way through. And that's not just uh, 
trivial point. It actually is what helps us stick with it is that we're noticing it. So if you have to, like in that little place where you do your practice and some of you in your apartments, in your homes, if you can have a corner of one room, whatever room seems most appropriate. And if you can afford it, dedicate that little corner, that little place. This is where I do my meditation practice. And, you know, keep it uncluttered, make an altar if you like that kind of thing, or have it in front of a nice window or next to a window or whatever is soothing, pleasing, calming for the heart and mind, right? And put your chair there, your cushions or whatever you use when you're sitting. And you can then put a note <laughs> so you remember, you know, I'm really resolving to come to this place every day. And even if I've had one of those really hard days and I didn't get there in the morning like I normally do, and now I've got my pajamas on and I'm really ready for bed, we can still go there for a couple minutes and not feel like, oh, wait, no, I said I'd do at least 10 minutes. Well, at least I'm noticing my intention to practice and I'm following through with it. And I'm going to that place and I'm coming into my posture and I'm for at least a few moments, I'm connecting with the reality of the present moment. I'm opening and I'm noticing that it feels right, that it, there's a pleasure to being present. Even if there's also, like if we've been avoiding a lot of pain and then we sit and we cultivate rediscover that capacity to be open, we're gonna feel all that stuff we've been in denial of all day long. Maybe we're grieving some loss, but we've been busy all day. And then we sit and we feel that loss, or we've got some physical ailment that we've, you know, don't really wanna feel like when we're starting to get sick, you know, and we, oh, I don't really wanna know that. But then we meditate when we're doing mindfulness practice, of course, on purpose, you know, it's like vulnerability on purpose. We're purposefully being open to a really courageous move saying, yes, 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 this too. Let me feel what's here to feel, especially in those first moments. But like I've been saying, it's really important. And I'd write this down at your place that you're going to practice. You know, something like, honey, check. Does it feel right when you practice? After you've sat for five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. After you're done and you, before you get up, then you just check. Did that feel like the right thing to do? What's the aftertaste of having done that? Th that is so important. It's like, we wonder how things come to be, new habits, new patterns, they get reinforced. You know, you go to some nightclub and you have a good time, you wanna go back to that nightclub. I mean, it's not rocket science, but we have to notice and the pleasure of this path of awakening is real, but it's subtle. So you have to be curious to sense it. And in life generally, it may be surprising, subtle is more significant than gross. So saying something subtle, shouldn't we shouldn't wrongly think that, well, then it's not that important if it's subtle. That's, that's sort of a, a sign of our, like I was saying, we're going against the stream, the cultural stream of distractedness. And part of the reverberations or the, um, you know, associative uh, problems with the distractedness is we're only sensitive to gross and we're not sensitive to what's subtle. And subtle turns out to be more significant than what's gross. Like this shows up in our sitting practice, which is one of the points I wanted to make tonight before we do our sit. 
you know, you're sitting and you're coming back to the body or coming back to the breath and you're connecting and sustaining awareness with your meditation object. Some of you might use your whole body sitting, like feel the whole body, the totality of the sensations of sitting. Some of you will come back to the ordinary breathing process, breathing in and out, and just the physicality of breathing in and out. Now, there's nothing magical about these meditation objects or how we're training. We just want something neutral to gather the qualities of the mind here in the present moment, in the knowing of something that's happening in the present moment, like sitting is like this, or breathing in is like this. You can even use hearing. Not trying to hear particular sounds, but just opening to the totality of that experience of hearing. Gathering the energy of the mind and the knowing hearing is like this. Feeling the whole body is like this. Noticing breathing out or breathing in is like this. And then sustaining it. So, you know, that returning and just that sense like we're well, there will be some grieving, the loss of distractedness, but we want to notice the pleasure of being connected to our life. Like when we're lost in thought, we've literally lost our life. Whatever we're thinking about, that's not the present moment. It's not our life in the present moment. It's some construction of the thinking mind. Like even the thought, I'm at common ground, isn't my experience being at common ground. So to be open to the feeling, the seeing, the hearing, the touches, the thoughts that are here and now, and to be aware it's like this, is not the same of being lost in the thought, I'm at common ground, I signed up for a six week introduction class to mindfulness meditation. And we're cultivating a taste for being present by noticing that it's pleasurable. And so when we have strong thoughts, you know, some kind of worry or some kind of planning or some regurgitation of past pain, that will be the gross thing. But the more subtle thing is, well, what's the underlying feeling here? Because that's what keeps the mind going back to that content. You know, we just want to keep going there. Why do we keep thinking that same thought or going back to that same memory? Well, it's there's some feeling we don't want to feel. So by learning how to not miss it, yeah, there's this content, but what's underneath that? Oh, there's this feeling here. What's the feeling? Can I be with that feeling? And it's almost like peeling back an onion, like, well, what's the feeling under that feeling? And basically, from gross to subtle. And the interesting thing is when we're with the more subtle quality that's here and now, corresponding or related to, you know, the thoughts that we would otherwise be identified with, all of a sudden... <clears throat> There's not really any need for the mind to keep thinking those thoughts because those thoughts existed because the heart wrongly thought, I can't be with that underlying feeling. It's too scary. It's too wormy. It's too unpalatable. So, so much of our thinking is a way of avoidance. But when we're, we have this capacity to have this depth, you know, from gross to subtle, and also this breath of continuity, then so much of our mental activity becomes less needed because we know how to be connected. We know how to be open. And both this breadth of awareness and the subtlety, the depth of awareness. And that's really what it means to be aware, mindfully aware. It really has that breadth. So even though we might use as a training to be with the breathing in and the breathing out or be with the whole body sitting or to be with hearing. So those are the three anchors or meditation objects 
you know, for this course, at least I'd recommend you experiment with and just choose one that works for you well enough and just stick with it because you want to develop a friendly relationship with your meditation object. You want your mind to like it because that's where it's learning. What the mind really likes is the, the unification or the gathering of the mind instead of being scattered, dissipated, pushed around by our likes and dislikes and our thoughts about this and that. Now, because we've learned to train in being present in this whole unfragmented, not distracted way, and we notice that feels good. It feels really good to be intimate in this whole relatively unwavering, clear, non-judging, kind way. It feels good. It's, it's literally like when we start to feel healthy after having been sick, it's a similar kind of feeling. The mind, its normal state, unfortunately, given you know all of our conditions, like the society we live in, it's scattered and the energy of the mind is dissipated. So when the mind comes together, we call it samadhi, that unification, that coming together, or you, a nice translation is the stability of wisdom and awareness. And it feels stable that, and it has a kind of energetic quality. Not that we're like fixed, like you can be moving, but there's just that um, uh, attraction, wholesome attraction and uh, not forgetting the present moment. There's a stability to it. So you, you notice all the off ramps the mind normally takes to worry about this, to compare myself to that other person over there, you know, to have this conceit, to regurgitate this memory. You notice the off ramps and you notice the mind not taking the off ramps or starting to take the off ramps before realizing I'd rather stay in the present moment. And that's, that's kind of the characteristic of that stability of present moment awareness. And that's where learning, the deepening of understanding, the deepening of insight really happens. When we've built up enough momentum in our wholesome desire to be present, that we start to feel, we, we actually know, oh, this is what the Buddha means by samadhi. We don't often translate that word these days because it's back when they first started translating the Buddhist teachings, they translated it as concentration. And it's actually kind of a bad way of translating the word samadhi because concentration, when we hear that in English, we think about focusing our attention on something like a one-pointed, don't deviate. But samadhi, that's a very limited way to understand samadhi. I mean, it's related for sure, but it's not so much about focusing. It's more about this valuing of the present moment so that the mind is remembering to recognize this is being known. And it's doing that with some continuity. And it's doing that like it may focus on a particular thing like the breathing in and breathing out as an anchor, but it also is aware of what's in the periphery, right? So it's not, we might use exclusive attention to meditation object when we need it, but we're moving in the direction of that widening it out and becoming a more inclusive awareness of the totality of the present moment. And that's why at the end of the sit tonight, and I think um, I maybe did it last week, but I'll do it for sure every week going forward. We'll always use five or 10 minutes of the last part of the sit and we'll drop the attention to the anchor and we'll just be aware of whatever's predominant. And if you want, you might even want to practice with your eyes open for those last five to 10 minutes so that you're not wrongly thinking that a, uh, being mindfully aware depends on your eyes being closed because that's not gonna work when we wanna be mindfully aware all day long, <laughs> right? You're not gonna go through your life with your eyes closed. So, so much of our day, our eyes are open. So we want to create a bridge so that the kind of awareness we're cultivating 
is really something we want to do more and more throughout the day. And when we're doing our formal sitting, like in the in the morning, let's say you do it in the morning, it's that time where we're going to kindergarten where the conditions are most suitable so we can develop some momentum. But it's really about creating a lifestyle where there's this ongoing value of being present. Oh yeah, it's like this now. So even if we're humiliated or upset or catch ourselves rushing, oh, it's like this now. See, we don't want to see ourselves, but this is that aware, you know, it, it's kind of problematic to say it this way, but it, it, it sort of works in English, self-awareness. And I, I'll explain later why it's a little bit problematic, but we're being aware. I mean, we say self conventionally, but what we really were being aware of what the mind is doing, the activity of the mind, what the mind is knowing, what it's doing. And it's a non-judgmental, continuous, clear awareness. It's receptive. It doesn't have an agenda except wanting to know. What's the mind doing? What's the mind knowing? Oh, this is what the mind is knowing now. This is what's being felt now. It's like this now. Okay, so uh, let's stand for a moment, stretch the legs, and then we'll do our sitting practice. I mentioned last week briefly that there's some walking meditation instructions and uh, all the emails that I sent to you all. It will have all of the um, handouts, the link to all the handouts. So you might track that down. So this week for sure, find at least one time to do some walking meditation. And it could be just in your hallway at home, back and forth standing at one end of the hallway, let's say, feeling the standing posture, feel the feet on the floor, for example. Notice if the belly's soft or being held tight, if the shoulders are soft or tight, if the eyes have tension, if the jaw has tension. So just scanning through the body. And we're just, in a way, we're growing awareness. <laughs> cultivating awareness of the whole body standing. And then when you're ready, just start walking and you can just feel the placing, placing, placing. So that moment where the foot makes contact with the floor, you just feel pressure, contact, right? And then again, and just walk at a pace. I mean, if you have a short hallway, you don't wanna walk at a normal pace because you're, you're crashing to the wall. So just walk at a pace that makes sense, that supports the continuity, present moment awareness, awareness. And when you get to the end of your little lane, you'll notice the stopping and the standing and the turning and the turning and the turning and the standing and then the walking. And it's like, so when you're walking, the physicality and especially the placing of each foot is sort of like using the breath when you're sitting or the whole body awareness when you're sitting or sound, right? And then like when you're sitting, the same thing happens maybe even more often when you're walking, a thought will arise or you'll notice a pile of stuff over there that you got to deal with and you'll start thinking about that stuff. So when there's a, when it's just a minor storm distraction, then just notice and then return to your primary anchor, which is the physicality of placing each foot on the floor, right? But if it's a big storm and the mind is taking the bait and it's gonna think about that anyway, then stop walking. Wherever you are in your lane, just stop. And notice, oh, what's the mind doing? It's doing this. So just be aware, oh, thinking, this is thinking. And you can actually mentally, if it helps, you can just, not in a kind of a controlling your mind way, but just acknowledge, oh, it's thinking, it's worrying, or it's planning. It's just planning being known. So you see how that really creates some space. It interrupts the habit of getting identified with the content of our thoughts, and it creates some space where the mind, or you could say the wisdom recognizes there are thoughts, and they're being known. 
And this is not a move to stop those thoughts. This is a move to be clear about the way it is. There are thoughts and they are being known, right? So we're harmonizing with the way it is. There are thoughts and they're being known. They may be really toxic thoughts. They may be relatively wholesome thoughts and they're being known. And so we're not really, we want to just connect with the simple reality. And the simple reality is always something is being known. Something is being known. And you can't really tease those two things apart. Like our visual experience right now that we're having, just have a soft gaze. You don't have to look at anything in particular. And there's seeing and it's being known. Aren't those both true? But we can't say, oh, the knowing is over here. The knowing of the scene is over here. And the scene is here. No. There's an experience that's characterized by something, the scene, which is being known. Or feeling the feet on the, making contact with the floor, pressure is being felt. Noticing someone in the room, seeing or hearing is being known. So whatever it is. So that's what we do with the storms, the interruptions, the distractions. Same with when we're sitting. So even though you might have a meditation anchor, like coming back to the breath or feeling the whole body or being present with the sounds, the cacophony of sounds, subtle and gross, but there will be interruptions. And it's not even a question like, should I be paying attention to this? You are paying attention to that, right? So then just acknowledge, oh, the mind is knowing this. The mind is thinking about this or worrying about this or comparing myself to this. And this is just this experience being known. Now, when, you're, when you develop the habit of being aware of these so-called distractions, then you don't need to label them, but that's just a skillful means that might be helpful where you just, and you could use the kind of language, you know, name it. And if you don't have any name to put on it, you could say, this is being known. This experience is being known. And if it's a mental activity, then say that. Mental activity or thinking is being known. But when you don't need to mentally label it, and of course you're doing that silently, then don't label it. But know you have that skillful means because when it's really uh, seductive, whatever you're thinking, and you're going to get lost in the thought, so you're not going to be aware that you're thinking that thought, that's a good time to use the mental note, to actually ask your mind to name. And you could prompt it by saying, what's the mind knowing? Right? Just think that thought. What's the mind knowing? Oh, planning is being known. Planning mind. It's just planning mind. And you can, you know, you'll get, you'll have your own way to relate to your experience. You can use phrases like, can this be okay? That this, yeah, of course it's okay, because it's already like this. The mind is planning. Feels like this in the body. That's another move that's always good. Is there a feeling associated with this mental activity? Like an emotional tone or underlying feeling? Well, what's the underlying feeling? Can I feel that? Can I acknowledge that's being known in the present moment, being felt in the present moment? Anything here and now that's not being acknowledged that maybe is relevant? You know, and it's just that humility and curiosity, and we connect to that. So whether we're doing our city meditation or you're doing some walking meditation, when there's a large, strong, predominant distraction, that is your practice. So that's why I said earlier, so-called distraction. Because if you're aware of a lot of thinking or a lot of worry or memory from the past, is that a distraction? No, it's just the next thing being known. And what we want is the continuity of present moment awareness. Not just always being with the breath. I mean, it's nice when you get some continuity with the breath because a lot of concentration, a lot of stability of awareness can begin to develop. A lot of tranquility and calm and peacefulness can come online. It's all very healing. It's very useful. 
but there's a lot of learning when we're with the breath for a little bit and then there's a distraction and then wisdom recognizes, oh, this distraction is just something being known. That is so powerful not to be, have a negative attitude about these so-called distractions. Because as soon as you know the mind is distracted, are you distracted? No, you're aware that distraction is something being known or being felt, depending on its nature, right? Now, it may not be easy, or easy to maintain that awareness because distractions, you know, whatever they are, tend to be seductive in the sense of the mind gets lost. So it's not so easy for it to know that this is being known. You know, like when we're doing um, scheming to get revenge, try to be aware of it. It's not easy when you're doing something negative to be mindfully aware. Oh yeah, I'm trying to get even with this person. I want, I really want them to hurt. And it feels like this, <laughs> right? Because awareness tends to undermine the momentum of unwholesome mental activity. And it tends to strengthen the momentum of wholesome activity. Not that you're trying to undermine the unwholesome mental activity or trying to strengthen the wholesome. It's nice to strengthen the wholesome. It's just the natural effect. When you're aware, it's hard to be a jerk. It is. Try it. This is, you know, it's hard because that wisdom and awareness, that stability of wisdom and awareness is revealing this isn't helping anyone. It's not for my own good, for anybody else's good, right? Like the Buddha used the example, when you're angry, when you're identified with your anger, it's like picking up a metal ball that's red hot with heat. Well, who's the first one that gets burnt? You know, you want to throw it, but you got to pick it up. So when we're identified with anger, not aware of it, but identified with it, it's harmful. I mean, when we've been spinning with anger and then we awareness kicks back in, we'll feel how the body energetically and mind are just in a knot. That can take hours, even longer sometimes, depending on how long we've been spinning to unwind. Okay, let's sit back down. We'll get ready for our half an hour sit. Make sure you have what you need to sit comfortably. And now that the other group is here, maybe someone can shut that door so that uh, we won't disturb them. Thanks. Be really honest with yourselves about the posture that's going to be good for you. It's really okay to use a chair, get a different cushion, whatever you need. And then cultivate a posture you can hold relatively still. Relatively upright. It can be a nice ritual to take a couple of longer, deeper breaths without rushing. Just take your time to fill and empty the lungs and do that two, three, four times, something like that. It's a way of making peace or harmonizing with the conditions that are here now. So maybe one more.
and eventually allowing the breathing to continue on its own. And just choosing one of those three anchors that I mentioned earlier, tuning in to the ordinary physicality of breathing in and out or opening more widely to include the entire body sitting, just the physicality of the sitting body, or perhaps being aware of hearing But I'll talk in terms of mindfulness of the breath coming in and out. So the first thing is to remind ourselves that it's really okay to relax, to soften, that whatever it is that we're doing in our practice, it really doesn't require the body to be tight. But we all have our habits of holding tension. So we need a lot of forgiveness, a lot of patience. And you might need to specifically invite the body to relax many times during the 30 minute set. As if we were to say to ourselves, honey, it's okay to relax. It's okay to soften. It's okay to put down the load or something like that. And so if we're working with the breath, we just become interested in the physicality of the whole body first for a few moments. Because it's right here in the experience of the body where we can, will naturally feel that more specific movement of sensation as the breath comes in and as the breath goes out. And there are different ways, of course, to feel the physicality of breathing in and breathing out. It might be that simple rising and falling of the abdomen, or it might be the touching at the nostrils, or maybe another way that is clear for you. But just finding a way to track that ordinary process of breathing in and then breathing out, just in order to keep it in mind. But we don't need to be tight, we don't need to focus. It's much more about receptivity. And of course, the rest of the body, the other sensations are just there in the periphery. But when we're doing mindfulness of breathing, we're letting the physicality of breathing come into the forefront of attention. And just feeling the sensations of breathing in from the very beginning of the in-breath all the way to the very end. Then there's a little gap, of course. And then feeling the sensations of the out-breath from the beginning until the end. And notice the pleasure in that continuity of present moment awareness. And be willing to begin again and again 
no need to get frustrated. And if the distractions are quite vivid and strong, then let that become the object of awareness for a while. Just acknowledging that mental activity or whatever it is as something being known or felt. Be curious about any underlying feeling so that it's acknowledged and felt. And then return to your training anchor when you feel ready. So let's continue now in silence for a while. I'll give more instructions in about 10, 12 minutes.
Remember to acknowledge with awareness distraction. Don't, no need to be frustrated by it. Just acknowledging it as something being known and be curious about the underlying feeling. See if it's okay just to feel whatever the feeling is. And again, 
Remember to sincerely invite the body and the mind to be relaxed. It's always okay to begin again. And if you need to, you can even take a conscious, relaxed, deep breath in and out as a kind of reset. Okay. Then use your meditation anchor to help to stabilize present moment awareness. We're building our confidence. Like if you're working with the breathing in or breathing out, just feel confidence that for at least that half breath breathing in, I can sustain this present moment awareness. This is being known. Breathing in is being known. Of course, you don't need to language it like I'm doing out loud now, but it's just that sustaining of present moment awareness recognizing what the mind is knowing.
And we're going to continue practicing for about five minutes, but if you feel okay about it, just let the eyes open slowly. Just a soft gaze. You're just looking down toward the floor in front of you. You're not looking around, of course. And just to make sure that the awareness has some breath, we realize we can just go through the six sense gates. So let's just begin by keeping in mind the simple truth that seeing is being known. And of course, we're not trying to figure out anything about the experience of seeing. We're simply acknowledging that it's being known, that seeing is being known. So in a way, we're cultivating this capacity to be receptive, in this case, to seeing. Just seeing. And in a way, we're learning to be exposed to the experience, experience of seeing. And then we'll do the same with hearing for about a minute. The full range, subtle sounds, obvious sounds. Hearing is being known. Seeing, hearing, and now touches. Skin is, of course, sensitive to touch. Sensations are being known. Pleasant, unpleasant, all the neutral ones. Is it possible to be Undefended, just exposed to the sensations that are coming and going. Soft, undefended. And probably not that predominant, but there's also smelling Tasting also happening, even though it maybe probably is quite neutral, the tastes, the smells. I'm just sensitive to the five senses together, five physical senses. And then including mental activity, that's also being known, including the mood or the attitude that can be felt or known. So the totality of our experience, body and mind being known, it's like this now. Nothing really outside, right? It's all something being known, being felt. And the key is to learn to trust or to relax with this exposure, really. Can this be okay? That it's like this.
And take a little time, adjust your body, stretch a little if you need to, to release tension. So I mentioned uh, last week how useful it is for people to share questions that are emerging in your practice, concerns, good experiences, difficult experiences. And you can even send it in to me via email, and then I'll kind of weave it in. And someone did send something in. Thanks, Valerie. And uh, this person wrote, I'm getting very good at noticing when my mind wanders while meditating and catching it and stopping it, but I don't necessarily feel anything about it. Most of the, most of my wandering in formal meditation are pretty benign. Thinking about a conversation the night before, planting, planning what I'm going to do after I meditate, etc. So I don't believe they have much feeling with them for me to feel or to give space to. Yeah, but that's, that is a feeling, isn't it? It's interesting how we somehow don't want to um, include neutrality as a feeling. And that's part of our, uh, the uh, delusion of our experience is the very deep habit to ignore, want to ignore what's neutral. Now the problem is, so much of our life is neutral, so we start disconnecting from a big part of our life, which is neutral. It's a very useful, important skill to know how to be intimate, present, sensitive to neutrality. Neutral thoughts, neutral sensations, neutral sounds, you know, one of, I'll just share one piece about why that's useful. Like those of you in the room can I'm probably, well, maybe at home you have something similar, but here in our room at Common Ground, we hear the blower. We keep it blowing because we have a really good ventilation system, which is nice, especially at this time with the viruses and stuff. So we hear that background sound. But mostly we don't notice it, right? Because it's neutral. But when we do bring our attention to something neutral, like that background blowing sound here in this room, we can get a sense, a better sense of what it is to be equanimous, right? Because when I'm really when I train myself to be intimate with that blowing sound, or like a lot of times, you know, we're not aware of the sensation of our clothes against the skin, you know, unless you have itchy clothes, it's so neutral, the t-shirt against my back or the weight of the sweater that I'm wearing on my skin. It's a neutral experience. But if I bring my attention, if I train myself to include that too, not just what's unpleasant or what's pleasant, but neutral. I learned something about how to be intimate and non-reactive with what I'm aware of. Because that's how we relate to neutrality. We're neither for it or against it. But instead of ignoring it, I can learn something about non-reactivity. It can inspire me so that, well, maybe I can have that same non-reactivity when things are pleasant or when things are unpleasant. Because we're learning from neutral experience how to be intimate without reactive. That's often why we train with things like feeling the whole body sitting. Or in this kind of space that most of us are in, it's, there are sounds, of course, but they're not, you know, they're not obnoxious sounds. So it's a kind of a neutral, you know, most, for most of us right now, the soundscape is pretty neutral. So if you use that as your meditation anchor, keeping hearing in mind, the hard part is staying interested, right? Staying attentive, 
keep returning, really sensitizing to the experience of hearing. But it's really useful because we learn how to really connect without reacting, without trying to make the sound, needing the sounds, needing the sensations, needing anything to be different than it is. So it's a really good training. So when you check, like you notice some thinking, and you ask that question, like Valerie mentions, well, what's the underlying feeling here? Oh, it's neutral. The underlying feeling is as if there's no feeling, but that's the feeling, isn't it? It's neutral, as if there's no feeling, but that's a feeling. It feels like this. And we'll notice neutrality a lot because not so much that we know the neutrality, but we notice the tendency of the mind to not want to be interested in it. Because our mind likes to be interested in the two poles, something that's pleasant, something that's unpleasant, we'll get interested in, but not neutral. So it's really good training. And the other piece to uh, Valerie's comment is that sometimes neutrality actually is more like numbness. Like the mind has a long time habit of suppressing and even repressing. And so the feelings, the sensations, the different experiences that are here to feel, they just need time to emerge from that, you know, the, the habits of not noticing or being numb. And that's why in practice, generally, there's a real emphasis on patience and receptivity. And being able to hang out there, not get confused by the thought, there's nothing happening. So when that thought arises, there's nothing happening, then what do we notice? We notice, oh, having the thought, nothing's happening. And then we check. Is there a feeling underneath that thought like, I'm doing something wrong? Oh, what's the feeling here? Oh, there's that feeling here. Can I be with it all? Yeah, I can be with that. It's not pleasant. But awareness, wisdom and awareness knows how to include that too. Yeah. Sometimes it's like this. And the mind thinks nothing's happening. And there's this subtle, anxious dread. I'm wasting my time. Or I don't know what I'm doing. And that might trigger some old pattern like, I've never been good at this stuff. <laughs> you know, this spiritual stuff. And, uh, you know, and that could lead to a whole storm. I'm just a superficial person. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. What matters is, can we just start over? Oh, doubt is like this. Thinking the thought, like if you don't know what kind of thought it is, just repeat it back. Like having the thought, I'm no good at the spiritual stuff, is like this. And remember, I'm languaging it to communicate with you all, but that doesn't mean you have to use all this language that I'm using in your practice. But you can when it's helpful especially when it's more stormy, more seductive, asking your mind to name it, name what the mind is knowing can kind of break through the identification the mind has with the content. So when I say, oh yeah, having the thought, I really should have stayed home. It breaks the spell, doesn't it? Like when I'm identified with the thought, I really should have not come tonight, you know? But then when I say, oh yeah, no, no, it's just that thought being known, having the thought, I shouldn't have come tonight. It feels like this. And then we're back valuing awareness. And remember, awareness is that reflective knowing of what the mind is knowing. Reflectively aware that this is what the mind is knowing or feeling. Good. Thanks, Valerie, for sending that in. And we have time. Be nice to hear from several of you, actually. What did you learn this last week? Practicing at home, doing your practice tonight. What was challenging? Those of you at home, you can just unmute yourself or raise your digital hand if you know how to do that. People in the room, you could just raise your hand. What have you learned? What was hard? What was unclear about the instructions? 
questions that are emerging? Yeah, please. And you know, to help the folks on Zoom, you could sit on the bench. And Uh, I had some issues this week and then in this practice tonight, uh, just like being tired and falling asleep, like not really falling asleep, but kind of getting close to it. Uh, and I had to kind of catch myself and notice it and come back to trying to practice. Yeah. And this is, uh, thanks so much. This is an issue that will come up, so don't be shy to bring it up again. And, uh, and, and even share like now, because I'll give you some strategies. So sleepiness came up, and then I related to the sleepiness in this way, and then this happened, and then I related. So that when you're sharing sometimes that blow by blow, what arose, how did the mind relate to it, then what happened, how did you relate to that, then what happened, that kind of demonstrates well, just that things are lawful or conditional, but also, you know, we can learn a lot about what's skillful or helpful and what's not skillful and helpful just by that tracking and just like we learn from each other sharing in that way. So I'm guessing, you know, all of us, you know, there's 20 in the room and about 25 online, 26 online. And so among us, there were probably a lot of sleepy ones <laughs> during the sit. Because, you know, some of it is that people are sleep deprived, but we know what to do about that. Get more sleep, get better sleep. So we're not here to really learn how to get better sleep or more sleep, but there are ways to improve your sleep, and it's really important that we do that. But even if you're getting enough sleep, sleepiness in practice is a formidable obstacle, even for very experienced meditators, because part of what we're cultivating is tranquility. And like I've mentioned, you know, when I was talking about neutrality, mostly what keeps us alert is our fixation on pleasure and pain. But when we're sitting purposefully, we've created a neutral space. I've invited you to sit in a way that's relatively comfortable, right? And we're not paying attention to things that are provocative unless there are provocative distractions. So when we're present with neutrality, we tend to get overly tranquilized, right? And then the thing is, our mind is a pretty simplistic, it's conditioned in a pretty simplistic way. So when things are really neutral and tranquil, the mind just assumes, well, this is probably a good time to fall asleep or to slip into some trance-like dreamy state. So we might actually be upright still, not actually falling over, but the mind gets gluey and heavy, and, uh, and it could be even pleasant. And it's not necessarily unskillful, but the concern in terms of meditation practice is there's no learning when the mind is dull and sticky and heavy and gooey, you know, and it's just like mush, right? Sometimes that trancey, dreamy, heavy. So generally what we want to learn is there's a delicate balance between times when our mind has too much energy, racing around, problem solving, comparing, regurgitating the past, right? And we can even have kind of an electric feeling like the body does not want to be still at times when there's not enough energy. And uh, how you practice, like there are ways like what we pay attention to, it can be a nice antidote. So if there were sleepy, if there's a lot of dullness, then interestingly, if we ask the mind to do more work, the meditating mind to do more work. So I was mentioning mental noting earlier, right? It takes some effort to, in your own mind, right, silently in your own mind, to say, 
having the thought, you know, basically repeating the thought back, or even saying, thinking is being known. But that effort to name, so even the, to name the different characteristics of getting dull and sleepy, like heaviness feels like this. But making the effort to say that in your mind is energizing. And generally, really connecting with the experience with interest is energizing. So when there's more dullness, you, you kind of create an antidote by more interest and making the mind do more, like mentally noting, kind of getting more specific into the details. Just like if you have a lot of restlessness, you might want to open up, not demand the mind get into the very details, really connecting with the intricacies of breathing in and breathing out, but just more generally knowing breathing in is happening, breathing out is happening, because it's more soothing and calming for an agitated, restless mind. But you'll learn this on your own, how to use the different anchors, how to invite the mind to relate to the present moment, because the present moment, you know, there are different ways. There's not just one way to connect with the present moment. It's quite a bit happening <laughs> in any moment, right? So what we pay attention to and how we pay attention to it is always in play, and that can balance the energies. So a couple of other things with sleepiness. Open your eyes, because it's more happening then, and that can help. You can also stand and do your meditation standing instead of sitting. That can help. Yeah. Any other comments about that? Yeah. So play with that. And then other people too around sleepiness check in with some of these strategies that, uh, that work for you. And also just kind of working with your posture can help too in a way that doesn't create a lot of physical pain. Good. Other comments? Looks like somebody online raised their hand. Gwen, you want to just uh, unmute yourself? Um, this is actually quite hilarious to me. because well, One second, I'm, Gwen. Let me turn you up here. Okay, go ahead. This is really hilarious to me because I'm a trauma survivor, so I've been a little hypervigilant, and I've tried to channel that into a positive when it comes to being aware. But what's happened is, and I'm, I'm laughing tonight, I can't knock the grin off my face, because on one hand, I'm, I'm aware of even more things. And specifically in my case, I've had like seven sinus surgeries. And I'm suddenly aware in just being in this class of humidity. And I'm a storm spotter, so I know about weather. But the humidity affects my breathing. And it's, it's like my awareness has expanded, but now I find this is my second class with this. And now I'm finding, okay, I've got to get a dehumidifier. I've got to get a humidifier and I'm, so that I breathe better and more effortlessly. It, it's, it is an increased awareness. And, and I think I thought it would calm me down, but it kind of, it's triggered a little bit of, of needing to fix things. So it's, it, it's really quite funny because I'm, I'm, the one thing I did do right is that in moving into this area and its apartment six months ago, I had lived with someone who cluttered the walls. And so I do sit with my eyes open and I have blank, peaceful things to look at. So that's wonderful. But, but I'm also, like I said, in, aware of, of more environmental factors. So it, it's really quite kind of funny. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. Gwen. Yeah, and it's true, you know, there's a, a bigger point to uh, what Gwen brought up for us, which is this practice does sensitize us, and which is generally good, but it's also hard to be a sensitive human being because we notice more clearly the patterns of our conditioned mind, the habit-based mind, right? And a lot of those habits are neurotic. You know, they're not great, <laughs> but there they are. It's not personal. You didn't ask to have that habit. That habit got set in motion because of causes and conditions, like how you were raised or whatever. And we just start noticing things about our room and the environment. 
And one of the things you'll notice if you hang out with a bunch of meditators, you know, people doing this kind of mindfulness practice, is they, you know, we tend to get hypersensitive about our clothes, about the food we eat, about, but that's not what we're trying to do. It's just wisdom hasn't caught up to the sensitivity. And it's that dynamic practicing, working with our mind in ways that make us more sensitive causes wisdom to deepen. Wisdom, you know, just the short definition of wisdom, is that understanding that this is okay. No matter what the circumstances are, workable, it's okay. It's just this. So you can call that equanimity. You can call it a profound resonant balance. But that piece of non-reactivity doesn't really mean every, anything if we're disconnected, if we're not sensitive. It's one thing to be happy when we're completely oblivious to all the suffering in the world and the injustice and the fact that we're going to die. And, and it's another thing to be balanced and peaceful when we're really real with the world we live in, in our body, in our mind, in our communities. We're not oblivious. So we need the sensitivity because the peace, the ease, the balance, the love is only really significant transforming when it's in the context of being really connected and sensitive. Does that make sense? So, and then you can see that like the concentration that continuity of present moment awareness, that stability of present moment awareness, it's sensitizing. On the one hand, it feels good, but then the rest of the day, like you have a good sit, you get some continuity of present moment awareness, some nice tranquility, peaceful. At the end of the sit, you're going, this is good. This feels really good. I trust this. But then as you kind of do your day, you realize it's like everything's brighter. You feel everything a little bit more. You sense so much more. And in a way it's good, but in a way it's a little hard being sensitive. But wisdom just hasn't caught up to the sensitivity. Yeah, Lewis, do you want to sit up here? So others, for the people online, can hear you. And then we'll end with this. Lewis is one of our longtime leaders. (laughs) Um, What came up for me is thinking about how when sensitivity gets more acute or if you're already empathic and you're interacting with people, you're picking up on information, you have no idea what it means and it can cause you to feel anxious. And once again, meditating to give yourself permission to say, to label it, as you know, anxiety about not understanding or not knowing, and just breathing into it and letting it go. And being patient with, well, eventually you might understand or not, or you can ask questions depending upon how you're getting to know the other person. That sounds exactly right. And that's a good description of what I was just saying, how wisdom catches up with the sensitivity. We're developing wisdom, so we feel that exposure, whether you're kind of just by nature an empathic person or you've cultivated a lot of sensitivity through your spiritual practices, and it's, you know, at times for sure, it will be overwhelming. You'll just be, and like Lewis says, you won't know even what you're feeling. You just know a lot is moving, a lot is being felt. And that's why that question, can this be okay? And then that's a real question. You're not like telling yourself, hey, this is okay. You're not demanding that. You're actually curious. This is being known, this is being felt. It's confusing. Can this be okay? Like, is it safe to relax? knowing that I don't know what this is. All that's moving, this anxiety, whatever it is. I don't know if it's my stuff. 
I don't know if it's your stuff. I don't know if it's the world's stuff. I don't know if it's past life stuff. I don't know. All I know is it's like this now. And the interesting question is, is it safe to be a, a sensitive human being? Is it safe to relax with the exposure that comes with being a human being? And we can directly explore if it is safe. We can practice relaxing, softening, allowing, and seeing if we become endangered or if things start to work better because we're relaxing and allowing. Because sometimes it's like this. It's really confusing. It's really intense. It feels really alive. And sometimes it feels like nothing's happening. And, you know, some people really thrive when there's a lot moving because they're already pretty good at creating space for that intensity. But they're totally a beginner when things are more simple and nothing's happening. It seems like nothing's happening, right? And they fall apart, like they lose their confidence, they have a lot of doubt, I must have taken a wrong turn or something like that. Or it could be the opposite. You're really good with that more neutral experience, but as soon as things get a little wormy or unknown or confusing, you lose your confidence in the practice. So there are always going to be places for each of us that are more edgy, where we're not so sure if it's appropriate to be open and intimate with conditions as they are. So then, you know, we, we want to learn how to both open to those edgy places, but sometimes the skillful thing is going to be to turn away, like to put our attention somewhere else. I can't really skillfully be with what's moving right now, so I'm going to go wash the dishes and bring my attention to that. Or I'm going to go call a friend and we're going to go take a walk and I'll pay attention to that. I'll be present with that because the sensitivity here and what I'm being sensitive to is throwing me for a loop. So we want to learn how to open to what's present, but sometimes we need this other skill of turning away. I know it's here, but I'm not going to pay attention to you right now. It might even be predominant, like what's really big in the moment, but I can't really be with this pain right now, the intensity of it. So what can I be with? Well, if I take a hot bath, I think I can be with that experience. So I'll go run a bath, and I'll put some cedar oil in it, <laughs> you know, and I'll light a candle, or whatever you need to create an experience that you can trust being present with, right? Because there's always, we get to play with what we pay attention to. Being present doesn't always mean being present with what's predominant. Sometimes it does, often it does, but not always. So, so much more to share together in the weeks ahead. Wishing you a good week of practice. Try to put in at least 15 minutes a day. Nice if you can do a 30 minutes, but if you can't do 15, even one minute, even two minutes of practice. And try to do walking meditation at least once during the week, just so you get a taste of it. Good. Hope to see you all next Tuesday evening. Thanks for coming.